Theogwich, Privit, and greetings from the beautiful, picturesque west coast of Ireland. Your Irish boy here grew up in the countryside, and as you can see, the Emerald Isle is indeed that green. At uh, yeah, we're almost in mid May, it is day 77 of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. For your reference about when I'm filming this and the information that I had on hand when I do my analysis. Today, I'm going to review a video from a doyan in the history of the region, Eastern Europe. Timothy Snyder, he's a professor at Yale University, and he also published a very famous book called Bloodlands, where he describes the unconscionable slaughter of, I think it's about 14 million people in Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia by the two totalitarian regimes that dominated the region during the 1930s and 40s. Uh, that is Nazi Germany and Stalin's Soviet Union. So he's definitely a guy who knows his stuff about the region historically. And he made a presentation where he outlines 10 reasons why Ukraine must win the war against Russia. So I'm gonna go into it and give you my thoughts, my analysis on his thesis. So let's get into it. Boyekali. Tsar experience. I believe that a victory by Ukraine is the only way in which this war can come to an end. A Russian victory will lead to further Russian aggression. A Ukrainian capitulation will lead to the continuation of policies of atrocity on Ukrainian soil. The one way I believe that this war can actually end is with a Ukrainian victory. That is, with sufficient Ukrainian success on the field of battle that Russia believes that it's in its, its interest to negotiate. So, is the only way to achieve peace in Ukraine a Ukrainian victory? Well, then you have to see, well, what's the alternative, uh, which would be presumably a Russian victory? Well, yeah, what's likely to happen if Russia wins? Well, first of all, they're going to oppress the population because uh, in the last election in Ukraine, pro-Russian parties only got 18% of the vote. So we'll just use that as a, a proxy for support before the war. And my analysis is that popularity for support for Russia has dropped considerably since then because they bombed the crap out of the country and sacked Mariupol. And, you know, there was all these war crimes. So uh, what I've noticed is anecdotally is that people, the few people I knew who were more pro-Russian who lived in Ukraine, all of them, maybe bar one, uh, are now extremely against Russia. Basically, the only way to rule a country like that, if you take over, is through massive oppression. And then, as I've outlined in my other video about where would Russia invade next if they uh, were to be successful in Ukraine, link it up above in the card down below in the description, well, they're just going to Moldova and then basically keep going until they're stopped. So, Russia winning, from what I can see in my analysis, it's not going to lead to peace whatsoever. It's going to mean probably a lot of oppression in Ukraine, a partisan war almost certainly to go over the long term and probably lead to a Russian withdrawal eventually. And then Russia would just try to go further and create conflict elsewhere in Europe. Yeah, I guess the other alternative is there's kind of a, a stalemate and then both sides seem, would agree to peace terms, but they seem pretty far apart. So I think they would just keep fighting until basically it's clear one of them one side or the other is going to win. So basically, yeah, I agree with his analysis on that point, more or less. Secondly, I believe the Ukrainian victory is important for the security of the region. Um, the only way that the Ukrainian population could be protected is by way of Ukrainian victory. But I believe it's also very significant for the populations of the Baltic countries, of Poland, of Romania, Moldova, that Russian aggression against a neighboring country not succeed. So basically, the second reason is kind of a corollary of the first one, which is what I said. It's like basically, um, well, the countries around them are definitely going to be better off if Ukraine wins this war and not Russia. Russia is in a revanchist autocracy. Two days before they launched this invasion, Putin went on TV. He said, he started off his speech by saying Ukraine is inalienably connected to Russia's sphere of influence and its borders are legitimate. And that's because his focus is just on Ukraine for the moment, but as soon as he were to grab and control all of Ukraine, he's just gonna go on to the next one. That's what revanchist uh, dictators do. Well, obviously the countries around that, they don't, they, it's not in their interest that they have this revanchist dictator that's winning. Fortunately, so far, it's gone so badly military for Russia, the chances of that are receding. But you see that probably Finland and Sweden are gonna join NATO as um, a reaction to Russia's invasion for security guarantees 
and uh, Russian, Russian commanders have outlined in the last month that they intend to go all the way to Transnistria, at least. So that's part of sovereign Moldovan territory, and Moldova doesn't really have much of an army, so it wouldn't take them long to go into Moldova, at least. The third reason I believe that Ukrainian victory is important has to do, above all, with the citizens of Ukraine. There is no other way to protect the citizens of Ukraine, I believe, than by Ukrainian victory. So long as the war continues, Ukrainian citizens under Russian occupation are subject to deportation um, and other forms of atrocity. Ukrainians not under Russian occupation are vulnerable to bombing and shelling. The only way to secure the 40 million Ukrainians is for the war to cease, and the only way for the war to cease is by way of a Ukrainian victory. Well, that follows logically if, like, he, like Timothy Schneider says, that you believe that the only way to guarantee peace is a Ukrainian victory, then obviously for the citizens of Ukraine, that Ukrainian victory would mean that they won't get bombed anymore, that they won't get, um, you know, living under occupation. A lot of times I hear the uh, pro-Russian fascists argue under my videos that, you know, so it's all Zelensky's fault. He should uh, sign peace terms with Russia and surrender, basically, so that his citizens don't get killed as if nasty things are not going to happen once they're occupied. So, yeah, obviously surrender wouldn't be great. Most people would probably leave. Uh, and those who did, who don't agree with the takeover, which is going to be the majority of people, well, they're going to be subject to other forms of human rights abuses. And um, yeah, it's going to be pretty terrible to live there. That kind of goes without saying. That's a pretty simple point. The fourth reason, extremely important, I believe, has to do with the defense of a democracy. One reason this war is being fought is that Ukraine is a democracy. Ukraine has that kind of unpredictable political system, which throws up unpredictable combinations, unpredictable leaders. It's that unpredictability, uh, it's, that, it's that inability to know what's going to come next that I think is so intolerable for Mr. Putin and for this kind of Russian regime. So one reason why it's important for Ukraine to win this war is for a democracy protect itself. Well, yeah, that's clear because Russia is not a democracy and the countries that in general supports are not democracies. That's not entirely 100%. They also are in alliance with Armenia, for example. Armenia looks like a democracy to me. Maybe I'm wrong on the granular level, but the big problem that Snyder didn't bring up for Putin and his regime in Russia, which is a revanchist autocracy, is that Ukraine, by choosing this promise of prosperity, is this promise of prosperity that Ukrainians have not gotten by staying more or less within Russia's sphere of influence for the last 30 years is something that was achieved by countries like the Baltic states, so Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and Poland, who have GDP per capita that is four times higher than Ukraine's GDP per capita, and actually double Russia's GDP per capita. And the only way to do that is by having an alternative system, and because that's what will be necessary to join the European institutions, so the European Union, and get access to those big markets because part of the accession criteria for joining the European Union is to clamp down on things like corruption and then have a democratic state, at least a liberal democracy. That's one of the preconditions. And obviously that's a complete clash to the model that Vladimir Putin has introduced and implemented in Russia over his reign of 22 years, which is a revanchist autocracy. So a successful Ukraine that goes and joins is very close to Russia's heart because, you know, basically Russia and Ukraine have had this interconnected history over a long number of years, and it was the second biggest uh, Soviet Socialist Republic in the USSR. And I think, more importantly, there's a perception that Russia cannot be a superpower without having Ukraine. A lot of people like to claim, oh, Russia's a superpower, don't poke the big bear, but it's not. It has an economy that's a little bit bigger, someone correct me last time, it's not the same size as Italy or Spain, but it's a little bit bigger than Italy or Spain. It's actually a good bit smaller than Germany even. And um, yeah, we thought it had a, the second best military in the world before this war, but no, it doesn't really look like it. Like it's that amazing, their military, but they do have nuclear weapons. But basically it's a regional power with nuclear weapons as opposed to a superpower. And it needs Ukraine in order to do that. So Ukraine having an alternative system that kind of precludes being in an alliance with Russia because it would join the European institutions just means that Putin himself and his model that he's created will be under immense threat, especially if Ukraine goes on to deliver the prosperity that Poland and the Baltics have seen. Can you imagine Ukraine having a GDP per capita twice 
of Russia. Actually having one higher than even Moscow, it's probably gonna mean that people also in Russia and like we've seen in Belarus with an attempt at a revolution as well to overthrow the autocracy, probably people in Russia would want a different system and want to also look west just for their own economic interests. But I believe, and this is my next point, number five, that this is important for democracies as such. Were Russia to win this war, that would be a tremendous victory for all forces that oppose democracy, for all people who are planning to use violence of one kind or another to overthrow democracies. If Ukraine wins, that is a victory for those who believe in law, who wish to hold elections, who wish to hold their leaders accountable, and especially for those who are willing to take risks for all those important things. Yeah, definitely. I think that if Russia were to win and crush Ukraine, then it would be a victory for those who oppose liberal democracy, right? So that's why you see a lot of elements of the far right and far left in Europe in particular, who sometimes in, from the US, who support Russia in this war. Because, well, basically, this, if you look back in history, at some of those far right and um, far left regimes, with, actually in 1939, they were in an alliance as well in the region when the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany invaded Poland. And they invaded Poland when Poland was actually further east. It's actually a lot of moves on the territory of what is now Ukraine, ironically. And basically, they're against the idea of a liberal democracy. They want to see authoritarian fascism or Marxism or national socialism, depends you know, where they are in the spectrum, but definitely they are against liberal democracy. So definitely these forces that tend to back uh, Russia in this war in particular are anti-democratic and them seeing a Russian victory would of course galvanize them in the fact that, yeah, just might is right. And you know, Russia itself has outlined along with China, another authoritarian or yeah, we'll call it authoritarian state for now. You know, they're basing in an alliance uh, against, I guess, the West in general, against liberal democracy that would give extra sustenance to an alternative that would become the new world norm if they were to win, if Russia was to win in this war. Relatedly, and this is reason number six, the, the, a victory by Ukraine is also a victory by a state which has traditionally been seen as peripheral, which has traditionally been seen as colonial against a power which would like to see itself as central and as imperial. Imperial wars, as we know, especially from the history of the 19th and 20th century, belong to a certain phase of political development. Uh, in, in, in imperial wars will, will continue so long as imperial powers believe that they can win them. Every European power and plenty of other powers reach a point where they realize that they will be exhausted by imperial war. And that is, frankly, a very good thing, um, a good thing for everyone concerned. So because this is an imperial war, a war in which Russian leadership claims that there's no Ukrainian people, there's no Ukrainian state, a victory by Ukraine is important to defend the basic principle that nations are equal and states deserve respect. In other words, a victory by Ukraine is, a, is one more push towards a post-imperial world. Yeah, I think that's often overlooked in the context of this war that Russia is basically an unreformed empire to a large extent. And it just sees Ukraine as not being really allowed, entitled to be its own independent state. That's what Putin said two days before the war in his speech. And uh, it's yeah, just basically a war of imperialism. It's is it any different to Nazi Germany's invasion of Poland and Lebensraum? Uh, although Russia is the biggest country in the world, he doesn't need Lebensraum, living room. Definitely, there is a denial of the right to exist separately from Russia for the Ukrainian state by Russia. It's an imperial war. You have this revanchist autocracy. President Putin has talked over the last year or so ad nauseum about history, the 19th century in particular. And, you know, that was an age of imperialism, uh, British Empire and also into the 20th century. You know, I'm sitting here in Ireland, and Ireland had its own history with colonialism and imperialism. Obviously, we were part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. And yeah, a similar thing kind of happened in the sense that uh, there was a war of independence, and basically, actually, in that war, the at the beginning, they came to a stalemate, the Irish rebels and uh, the British state, and they signed a peace treaty and gave Ireland limited independence. Basically, Britain recognized that 
They couldn't continue the war the way it was. It was too costly. Interestingly, Ireland wanted and waited and petitioned very heavily for US involvement and support, which never came. So you call it like a kind of like a proxy for for NATO today, or you know, that was like the NATO at the time, the win for just the US. Obviously, the US was the biggest contributor to NATO. And actually, if they'd gotten the support and weapons from the US, then probably they would have actually won decisively and made it more costly for the United Kingdom, probably got full independence, and maybe the country would never have been split because Ireland obviously had to, the Irish rebels had to make a big compromise uh, from what they actually wanted for the country at the time. But Irish history is another thing to delve into, maybe on a a different day, but not for uh, this video. So definitely, yeah, it's a war of imperialism and it will, you know, there's this kind of attempt from revanchist autocracies. Maybe China would try something similar with Taiwan and say that they're going to take that back by military force. If Russia was successful, it's probably going to be more likely than if Russia loses. So whilst it is a bit ironic since, you know, Britain, France, the US, they actually act very often in imperialistic ways themselves <laughs> across the globe, they don't necessarily, don't, I just have to think if that's true. They, they don't go and invade their neighbors and try to change the borders and deny their neighbors the right to exist, at least not in the last few decades since the end of the Cold War. Obviously before that, they were claiming that and been hypocritical and obviously they launched other wars for imperialistic reasons to control resources. You just have to look at the invasion of Iraq by the US and UK to see that. Definitely it would be overall a minus one for imperialism if Ukraine goes on to win, which I already predicted, uh, already called the war on day 30, that they would win in the war. Speaking of a post-imperial world, my, my seventh reason for believing the Ukrainian victory is important has to do with the recollection of the Second World War. In Mr. Putin's telling, the lesson of the Second World War is that we need more war. In Mr. Putin's telling, the lesson of the defeat of fascism is that we need more fascism. In Mr. Putin's telling, the lesson of the defeat of imperialism is that we need more imperialism. In Mr. Putin's telling, the lesson of the Second World War is that the word Nazi just means whatever he wants it to mean and can be deployed as hate speech against whoever happens to be his enemy of choice. That is one reading of the Second World War. It's not a reading of the Second World War which should prevail. I think it's very important as this war is being fought to consider it, as so many people are doing, in the light of the Second World War, but in particular to consider it as an opportunity to preserve certain virtues, which many of us believe were reinforced by that war or should have been reinforced by that war. Toleration for difference, for example, the importance of the rule of law and pluralism, for example, the importance of cooperation among democracies, for example. Okay, I think that's, that's quite a long one. I think he misses the difference, a core difference here when he outlines it between the worldview of Western liberal democracies like the US, the UK, European Union, and the Soviet Union at the time and now its successor state, Russia. Because first of all, Putin's telling, he doesn't put it in those words that, hey, we're going we're imperialists and we're going to take it, we're fascists and we're going to invade Ukraine. He coaches it in the complete opposite terms. Of course, in reality, Russia is a revanchist autocracy that's probably in the spectrum somewhere, just a bit to the right of fascism at the moment. Yes, it's clearly imperialistic, uh, but that's not actually the telling that he gives to it. Of course, he, as Snyder says, he corrupts the whole idea of what Nazism, he just throws that term, Ukraine is ruled by Nazis, new Nazis, because he doesn't like the government because he wants to leave its sphere of influence and he just throws that out without really any uh, significant uh, justification or cogent argument. They just rant about the Azov Battalion and at the same time the Russian forces have the Wagner Group, <laughs> which is also founded by allegedly a Nazi and I'm sure it has the similar kind of characters in it as that Azov Regiment. So that doesn't mean all Russians or Russian soldiers are Nazis and the Russian government is Nazi, no. That's ridiculous. Uh, but I don't think it's actually the telling that he gives to his own citizen, how it's interpreted. And a lot of that comes down to the fact that what Schneider outlined, like democracy prevailing and certain virtues, is a very Western interpretation of what happened in World War II because that's the history we tell ourselves, the victory over fascism and national socialism was to have our liberal democracies. Well, Soviet Union was not a liberal democracy and we were in an alliance with them. Now, Soviet Union was from 1939 to 1941 in, in alliance with Nazi Germany 
and they had the non-aggression pact and the seed protocols to the to the pact itself, the Ribbentrop Molotov Pact, and they invaded Poland and the Baltics and they annexed those. And obviously the Soviet Union under Stalin in particular was totalitarian and they murdered millions of people, many of which were their own citizens, and the nature of the state was still dramatically different otherwise to, say, fascist states like Italy or Romania, and uh, national socialist states like, like Germany was. But their victory was just over the, I mean, they use the umbrella term fascism, they really mean national so far right, so national socialism slash fascism that were allied together in general against uh, the Soviet Union and the more liberal democracies like uh, the UK, and the US, but their victory was not to have a liberal democracy. So those virtues do not apply in the history in the sense of what Russians and actually Ukrainians uh, and other people from the former Soviet Union have as a history of why they won. When they celebrate May 9th, they don't celebrate the, the victory of liberal democracy over fascism slash national socialism. They celebrate the victory of the Soviet Union and Soviet totalitarianism over fascism slash national socialism and the reason that they were in a war with national socialism with the Nazi, with Nazi Germany primarily was because uh, Nazi Germany invaded them to take their resources and basically commit a genocide ultimately in the Soviet Union create their own labels around living room uh, as part of their ideology for the state before that Stalin was allied with them and he was invading the Baltics he was they, they invaded Finland they they, they took a heavy they got a basic Pyrrhic victory there of sorts and took some territory that they still have, Russia now has from Finland at the time. But it's not because they were fighting for a liberal democracy. That's a very key point because the Soviet Union went on to uh, commit atrocities uh, while they were advancing through the territories they liberated that had been previously in the Soviet Union, like parts of Ukraine. And then they went in to occupy and annex parts of say Poland and they committed massacres there and then they went into the rest of Central Europe all the way up obviously to what was then became East Germany and they oppressed the people and they had a, a, a best authoritarian puppet states there and at worst they had totalitarian states that, million, that killed large numbers of people sending them to the gulags if they weren't uh, willing to collude with their, the puppet states that they then installed in, in many of those places. So their interpretation of history is very different. For example, the Red Army's uh, atrocities are never questioned. I've never seen any que anyone question them in Russia or Ukraine, and people tend to get very sensitive if you question the gallantry of the Red Army. Maybe that's going to be different uh, because of this war and the war since 2014 in Ukraine, but you know, just anecdotally, I've never had people question that what they did. I mean, and there's many much documentary evidence of mass rape, murder as they uh, went westwards. Uh, and then afterwards, you know, the history of Poland and the Baltic states is one from their perception of occupation and oppression by the Soviet backed governments in those countries that they installed. So that is a very Western view by Snyder and it's not one that's shared in Russia today for sure. That's not the interpretation. So um, yeah, that I don't really agree with how he's presented. Of course, in reality, the Russian state is, yeah, it's, hard, it's definitely not a liberal democracy and it is and some were probably, you know, political scientists who studying this all day and made a career we can probably say exactly where they are in the spectrum. But basically Russia is a fascist state and leading a war of fascist imperialism at the moment. That part I agree with, the rest of it, not so much. Number eight, I believe that Ukrainian victory is also very important for the future of Russia. Now to be very clear, I don't expect Ukrainians to be thinking about this factor, but for the rest of us, who are concerned about the security of Europe and security of, of the world, it's very important what kind of Russia we'll be living alongside in decades to come. For Russia to become, let's call it, a normal country where Russian interests are observed by Russian leaders, it's very important that Russia lose this war. It's very important that Russians cease to pursue a foreign policy which is about gathering in land on the basis of entirely untenable myths. I believe it's very important for Russia, for Russians, and for future Russian governments to be in a position to think instead about the future of Russia and about the reality of Russian interests. And I think a defeat on the battlefield here, although I wish there weren't battlefields, I wish there weren't a war, I believe that a defeat on the battlefield here will be a step forward towards that kind of Russia, a Russia where Russians are able to think about a future 
away from imperialism, a Russia where the past perhaps weighs a bit less heavily as a myth on the decisions of the present, and a Russia where interests can be considered and the future can be considered. So there he talks about the interest in Russia and Russians seeing them lose the war. That's pretty controversial to say because it's not, it's a bit counterintuitive to think, well, if you lose the war, it's in your interest. No one really thinks losing the war is going to be great for your country. But the, the issue is that I guess the assumed uh, consequence of losing would be that the current, you know, autocratic, revanchist, fascist state that Putin has turned Russia into, unfortunately, would then cease to exist and they would have to reevaluate. And I guess he's trying to say they would become probably a liberal democracy. There's no guarantee that would happen. It could be become a complete totalitarian basket case like North Korea if it, it loses as well, right? It could go into its more shell, become more dangerous. Also, Russia could collapse as a result of the uh, a, a defeat, especially a major military defeat. Uh, it could split up into different countries. There could be civil war everywhere. There could be loose nukes. There could be massacres all over Russia as different ethnicities start to, you know, rise of local nationalism. So there are a lot of things that could happen if Russia loses the war that would be bad for Russians as well. But to have a chance for the younger people of Russia to have a better economic future, the kind of promise of prosperity that Ukrainians are striving for in trying to join, say, the European Union and be a more liberal democracy in order to achieve that, I think that would be better served by, yeah, regrettably, they're going to have to lose a war in order to change that direction of the country, probably. But it will be, it will unleash a lot of probably unpredictable, uncontrollable forces within Russia. And that could be a very dark period also for the country. It could lead to the collapse of the state. Is that good or bad? Well, it depends what replaces it. It depends what leaders would replace Putin probably in the, you know, in the event of a defeat. I can't see him just changing the whole state to become a liberal democracy himself so probably that pressure would come from another a replacement that's a bit controversial to say i'm not so sure that it's so clear but at the end of the day and that's one thing that's disappointed me particularly with this war and i know there are you know my russian friends personally are against the war and you know it is a authoritarian state and protesting in public against the government is extremely difficult and there were protests at the beginning of the war but at the end of the day, it seems like Putin, based on the best information we have from Levada, is more popular today than he was at the beginning of the war. And that means a lot of Russians support what is going on. And that is extremely disappointing. So, yeah, maybe they need to lose the war <laughs> in order to reform the state and live in a better state and definitely live in peace and harmony with their neighbors more. Number nine, Ukraine must win this war because Ukraine, as everyone knows, is a major source of food for the rest of the world. Yeah, I think that goes without saying that we all want food to be exported so we can pay less for food and energy and stuff like that. So finally, last but not least, and in some ways summing up all of these other points, a Ukrainian victory is necessary to help point not just Ukrainians, but all the rest of us towards the future. In a way, the problem of Russian propaganda is a problem that we all share, perhaps in less sharp form. Russian propaganda is all about the past. It's all about how things are predetermined. It's all about seeking some kind of moment at some point in history where we were right and everyone else was wrong. But that's not what we need. We, everyone, needs a future. We need a politics of the future. We need an event that can break us out of our rut and which can point us towards a future. I believe it's very important that Europeans and others help to offer Ukrainians a future after this war in the form of membership in the European Union and in the form of, of generous aid, which allows Ukrainians to rebuild. But I think the process goes two ways. I think if we are open-minded and generous about the way we look at Ukraine and about how we look at this war, we can see that Ukrainians are also offering a future to us. Had Ukrainians not fought, had Ukrainians capitulated, our future, the future of democracies, would look very bleak right now. Because Ukrainians did resist, and because Ukrainians are fighting, they bought other democracies a certain amount of time. I think this time should be used to think about the future, not just a future in which Ukraine joins other democracies in important forms of cooperation, but also a future in a broader sense, where a Ukrainian victory demonstrates that individual action matters, that people can take responsibility, that the range of possibilities is broader than we think, that there are things that can happen in the future that are perhaps 
perhaps better than we think. Ukraine or Ukrainian victory also points us in this direction. Okay, so that's quite a long final point from Timothy Snyder. So the, to go to the first point, definitely the idea of a future is in antithesis to the worldview of Vladimir Putin uh, on May 9th when he gave his speech in Red Square. He's just the whole aesthetics of it and the nature of his speech, it was all about the past. I know he tried to tie it, tie it in with the war, what he would call the righteous war in Donbass. Uh, but it was very weak. He couldn't really make much of an emotive as a younger person than I think his target demographic, like not the Babush Brigade, who are all these pensioners who just cheer on and uh, watch state TV all the time, think, oh, the Soviet Union is great, let's go back to that. But it wasn't very, you know, he was surrounded by old people. Uh, he's an old man himself. It just, re and he is talking, you know, he's, he's stuck back in the 19th century in his worldview, and he brought up traditional values, but it's anti modernity. Uh, it's, it's anti the future, basically, his message. And that is something that's going to be very important in a Ukrainian victory is that that worldview doesn't prevail for sure. And that should be supported, and particularly on the European continent, European Union being the biggest player in the United Kingdom as well. In terms of rebuilding Ukraine 100%, Ukraine needs to be the success that, say, West Berlin became during the Cold War. You know, that shining example of alternative worldview. I mean, the, the, the alternative worldview there was the Soviet Marxist one in East Berlin and East Germany versus Western liberal democracy and capitalism in West Berlin or Western Germany as well. And this has to be a similar dichotomy. And I think that will reinvigorate, I think also the European Union project that, you know, think about it, Ukraine has consistently been, I think the only country that has shed blood to be on that path, to be on the path to the European Union. Uh, in the sense that, like, Euromaidan revolution, there were a lot of EU flags. It was to leave Russia's sphere of influence to join the European Union, eventually, or be on that path to join the European Union for that promise of prosperity. You know, that's also been the blood that's basically been spilled also from 2014 to 2022 as well. Why is, you know, well, it's also for territorial <laughs> integrity because Russia invaded. And now, again, when Russia invades, the blood has been spilled so that they don't live under Russian occupation. And they can have that future that they desire as being part of the European family. And they've applied for EU membership and become a candidate country of the European Union with the objective of joining. Yeah, I think as a final point, Ukraine must win not just for Ukraine, but for all of Europe and all for the liberal West. I don't think democracy, uh, liberal dem democracy of the West, I want to say, I don't think democracy is some sort of panacea. Obviously, there is <laughs> hypocrisy in a lot of the imperialistic ambitions of many of, uh, you know, the Western democracies as well. It's not like it is some sort of utopia. I think it was Churchill who said that democracy is the worst system in the world, except for all of those that have been tried in the past. Something along those lines, I'm probably butchering his quote, and that's basically the way it is. But you have to look at the alternatives. Do you think that the alternative that people like Putin have laid out as their worldview and the future for you, is that what you want to live in? And I also laugh a lot of times at these fifth columnists who cheer on Russia, and I'm like, uh, why don't you just go and move to Russia? <laughs> if that's what you want, why are you hanging out in London or in you know, a nice sunny Cyprus, or maybe you're off in Paris in France, or you're in Berlin, you're... I don't know, in, in Sweden or Finland, or wherever it happens to be, or you're off in Miami or somewhere in the US, Canada. Why don't you move to Russia? I mean, if it's so amazing there, then just move there. And, you know, frankly, life, depending on your circumstances, is not terrible by moving to Russia. I used to help Western men before this war move to all the countries in Eastern Europe, and some of my clients were interested in moving to Russia. So why don't they go and do that? I suspect because they don't really want to live in that kind of society either on some level. I don't know why they're cheering it on. Anyways, I'm going to end my video there. And uh, we have this beautiful evening on the west coast of Ireland. Yeah, the weather is very unpredictable. If anyone's been to Ireland, never come for the weather. But we got this beautiful evening. So drop me a comment down below what you think of Timothy Snyder's 10 reasons why Ukraine must win. And maybe you're a pro-Russian war troll, and you're going to tell me 10 reasons why Russia must win. But drop them down below in any case. And let's see what this discussion brings. See you in the next video. Obviously, I'm going to end this with Slava Ukraini, and I'll see you in the next video. Uh, Slong Gofol, which is goodbye in Irish. Dopabachina, Dasvidanya. Ciao, ciao. 
Pixar Experience.